We've saved a seat just for you. There's always room at the table. It's Coffee with the Pastor with your host, Andy McDaniel. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with the Pastor. We are so excited to have you with us today. We're so glad and honored to be with you. Uh, As always, we uh, are just humbled that you would be willing to share a part of your day with us here at Coffee with the Pastor and what we do. I am your host, Pastor Andy McDaniel. Currently, I have the absolute privilege and honor of uh, serving the wonderful people of West Fayetteville Baptist Church right here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We we meet every Sunday and every Wednesday and all kinds of various times and events in between. You can learn all about that at WFAYBC.net, or you can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and all the other platforms that you may find us at. As you know, as we've been visiting together, ministering together now for several weeks, months actually, we're getting into, uh, our goal here at Coffee with the Pastor is to encourage. Our goal is to inspire, to challenge sometimes when needed. But in general, our intent is to provide you with a relevant conversation with things that matter. That's what we do. And since we, we started you know, a few months ago, we have had a variety of topics But we always keep our faith in Christ at the very, very core. That is the number one thing that we do. That's the most important thing that we do in the conversations we have. Well, every week we have a very special guest with us, and today is certainly no different. I want to welcome to Coffee with the Pastor uh, my friend Brad Kane. Now you may think, well, who is that? Well, if you are a professional wrestling fan, you may know him a little bit more better as Lodi from the days of World Championship Wrestling when it dominated the airwaves back in the 90s and early 2000s. Brother, it is great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And it's ex- exciting, you. exciting to have you here today. Well, Lodi, um, as always, we begin Coffee with the Pastor with having our having our guests share a little bit with the audience about, uh, you know, their journey to Christ or their current events, different things that are happening. So well, just share some of your story with us today if you can. <laughs> Oh, where do you start when you? That that's a wide open question there. <laughs> you know, I when I was young, I I jokingly tell everyone that mom and dad had an open door policy at church. If the church doors were open, we were in church. <laughs> Absolutely. Whether it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, potluck dinner, vacation Bible school, I grew up in the church. And sadly for me to say, when I started wrestling, a little before that, but I got away from my walk with Christ, and during my time of everyone thinking I was so successful because, like you said, on TV three nights a week, World Championship Wrestling and doing a pay-per-view once a month, and, you know, you couldn't stop by a newsstand and not pick up a wrestling magazine and see my picture in it. I was on video games, and I was a guest VJ on MTV and VH1 when they used to show videos. They don't know they don't do that anymore. No, it's all reality. It's all reality TV (laughs) and games and that kind of stuff. But back when we were, you know, when we were younger, they used to actually show videos. Um, but while to the outside world, everyone thought I was successful and I had so much going on and inside I had really gotten to a bad spot in my life. And again, far away from my walk with Christ Mm -hmm. as I, as I could have been. And I ended up losing my job with world championship wrestling as they were scaling back, losing money. And right before the, the buyout came by WWF, but it was shortly after that time, after I ended up going through a, a stand in rehab to deal with my substance abuse that I realized where I needed to be and got my life back right with Jesus mm-hmm. again. And so that was when, you know, as an adult, I got back to the things that, you know, talk about my parents taught me when I was very young. And so I ended up back there and back in church and became a youth group leader at my church and awesome. started speaking and have been blessed ever since to actually do you know a lot of speaking engagements and that kind of thing so my life has gone a long way from where it was when my wrestling fans saw me on tv and i still wrestle uh, but the interesting thing to everybody if they don't remember if they remember the old Lodi character and they see the new Lodi character where i was a bad guy on tv you know playing the heel and coming out with signs about how i hate this town and right. this town stinks you know now i come out with bible verses on my signs and i'm 
pretty much 99.9% of the time a good guy these days. <laughs> so that's that's quite a change for a lot of people when they see me. They're like, hold on, aren't you the same guy that? I'm like, yeah, that was me then, but this is it. me now. Love it. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, the, it, it, and my uh, my girls still have one of those signs that you gave them. <laughs> <laughs> it is always interesting to me when people come up and they're like, you know, I had a sign of yours you gave me back in 2004, and I'm like, it's 19 years ago. Yeah. Like, yeah, I still have it. And I'm yeah. like, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, those, uh, but you know, it, it, it really is the um, the value of of that perception. You know, that people they do remember and, and things like that. But being able to show them, you know, uh, our character versus our identity is, is right. two different things. You know, and, and you know, and I just you know, I, I thank you I absolutely. Thank you for sharing part of your heart. And you know, I, I know without a doubt the conversation we're going to have today, we're going to. Uh, we're going to touch some lives. I believe that with all my heart, you know, because some of the things that we're going to touch on and, and, and a gigantic miracle uh, that recently took place in your life, we're, go- we're going to include that in our conversation today because I, I really think that um, what we do here at Coffee with a Pastor is, is reach into lives, man. We talk about reality because uh, that, that's important. Back in, back in 1990, uh, when we were just young pups, uh, or, or so, something along that line, there was a there was a band. Uh, the big hair bands were kind of you know fading out of the '80s or whatever the case. But Poison had a song called "Something to Believe In." We certainly are familiar yes. with that area of life. Well, th- those words, for whatever reason, and I can't really say why, because that that's obviously not on the air anymore, or any of that kind of stuff, unless you listen to the oldies. But uh, those words have been bouncing around in my head a lot lately, and because it seems like. We're, we're living in what I would call unbelievable times. And by that, I, I don't mean just amazement, but literally unbelievable, that we, we're blown away at what we're seeing. We can't believe that this is really going on. So I right. want to talk about, uh, Lodi, I want to talk about the value of our testimony, the value of our, our witness. Because, again, we, we see so many things today that are presented that ask the public to believe, that ask the public to believe but often what we're being shown is less than honest. Right. And, and, and so, so suspending belief for a moment or for a movie or for a wrestling match, for that fact. I mean, we, yeah. we, all, we all understand the industry. But how important is it, and, and I want you to, to talk about with, in, in this segment of our show, how important is it to be real when it comes to our faith? And oh. how much of a challenge is that? I think it's very important, as you talked about unbelievable times. There are, you know, I was a political science major in college and a bit of a news hound. And if you spend much time watching cable news these days, it's very easy to get thoroughly depressed and disgusted. And just, (laughs) as you said, hard to believe some of the things we're hearing and seeing. It's like if I didn't have a Bible that told me there would be a day when we would call good, evil, and evil good, I would really be questioning some things right now yes. Yes. if we didn't have that biblical background to follow. I, I was driving over today from Charlotte, and I was on the phone with a great friend of mine, and, and she was said, I'm, just, I'm getting so downtrodden and beat up with this. I, I don't know if I need to watch the news anymore. And I said, but the good news is Jesus is still on the throne. Amen. And that's what we have to look forward to no matter how, and, and the things we know through reading the Bible, it's going to get worse. Yeah. And I, I don't say that to scare someone, but I'm just, you know, if you know those things are true, but you know Jesus is still on the throne, and like I do with a lot of books, I skip to the end, Jesus wins. That's right. <laughs> so we're <laughs> all good yeah. as yeah. long as we can get through what we're facing now. So when, when it talks about being, you ask me, is it difficult to be real or be genuine with sharing your faith? And I don't think that's hard for me because— that's why I'm still here. Amen. If, if it wasn't for Jesus, there we, we had a discussion earlier, you and I, about how many of my coworkers and guys you know and knew personally uh, in the wrestling industry that all passed away well before their time, mm-hmm. whether it be to substance abuse or suicide or whatever it may be, guys who didn't make it out of their 40s, That's right. didn't make it into their 50s, where you, know, you and I have had the opportunity to at least make it that far. And some of those things would just blow your mind. Like, how, you know, how did they go and I'm still here? Yeah. 
and it's all part of his plan. And, and, and I think for me to explain that to people was, you know, when I talked about taking the change in my wrestling persona to being a bad guy and carrying signs, putting a town down, to now using wrestling as my ministry to spread the faith and the gospel. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, intermission and before the show, sitting at my table, you know, my pictures all have a Bible verse on them. My mm-hmm. shirts have Bible verses on them. And it's so cool when a young kid comes up, maybe eight or nine years old, and he's like, you're a wrestler and you're a Christian? You can be both. You can be both. <laughs> you That's can right. be both. That's right. And that is something when I came up in this business uh, of wrestling, it was not something that was widely talked about That's in our right. industry. We didn't talk about the Bible. We didn't talk right. about God. We didn't talk about Jesus. That was a real taboo subject in the yeah. locker room. But uh, some guys you mentioned earlier, whether it be George South or Nikita Koloff and guys who were not afraid to come out and be bold about their faith as we moved into – today and in the Carolinas you've got Caprice Coleman and you had Gunner who just retired um, guys who are not afraid to share their faith and I think that's been one of the biggest changes I've seen in the wrestling industry where guys are just not afraid to be real like this is who I am and my identity's found in Christ well you got to love that because I think again we we see so much uh, confusion in the world and and I believe that there's a hunger for reality you know, we, we, we jokingly talk about reality TV, right. but of course we know how, you know, we know how that <laughs> works. But, but, the, but in sincerity, though, I, we, we see so many people that are hungry for the truth. Uh, they're hungry for, for reality, something that will, again, like that song, something to believe in, something, something they can hold in. on to. And I believe that our, our testimony is so, it has such a, a great value. You know, we, we oftentimes, we associate belief with visual. Because oftentimes, you know, we say, well, if I, if I can see it, I can believe it. Times it. But we also know, though, that not everything we see is real. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we know that from, from, from whether it's magic or whether it's what well, we see. So, so deception is one of the enemy's absolute greatest tools, greatest tools. So how do we kind of as we, as we go into the further portion of this first segment, how do we, how do we protect our testimony and leave no room for those who might doubt? That's a great question. I, I think being genuine and openly honest about what God and Jesus have done in your life and not being shy and being more bold about it, I think that's something I find is a problem among men these days is because of our societies not wanting to step on toes or to offend people, it's like so many men have pulled back and not only are they not being bold, but they're not even scraping the surface sometimes mm-hmm. when it comes to talking about things like faith because they may be afraid of who they're going to offend. Right. And I think that's a scary, slippery slope to be on uh, where I feel like we're called in the Bible to be bold men of God yeah. and bold with the gospel. And that means sharing it everywhere with everyone and, and being genuine about it. And when you have you said your testimony i was speaking with and and discussing this with nikita one time before about some of my speaking engagements and i remember telling a long time ago i'm like you know once you've told your testimony so many times (laughs) it's one of those things where it's like you know it becomes almost mundane to you Mm -hmm. but as nikita explained to me he's like for that guy that's hearing you speak for the first time in west virginia it's all new to him absolutely and while you may know it because you lived it it still has a whole lot of value for someone who has it because, like you said, they can see with their own eyes someone that they knew had problems, had issues, and then were able to turn their life around Absolutely. because of the love of Jesus. Yeah, it changes everything, you know, and I think that that is the, the value that, that we find in that is because uh, there, there there's so many people that are struggling with the things that even like this you talked about, whether it's addiction, whether it's, it's you know, just, just being lost in life in general. And, and I was teaching recently, you know, and it said that Jesus looked out and he saw them as, as sheep with no shepherd. You know, and, and the concept of that is they were lost. They had nobody to show them anything. And I think the value of, of our testimony and keeping it real, it's not about beating people over the head of the Bible. Right. You know, it's not about it's not being, you know, over overbearing because sometimes people don't address that as well. But when they say, wait a minute, you're the real thing. You actually mean 
what you say. You, mm-hmm. you know, you're not playing a character on TV anymore. That you're actually, right. you know, like before we could say, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I played one on TV. You exactly. Know, you know, nonsense. But 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 when when person sees, you know, that you're you really are sincere. You know, that they can actually sit and and not just physically, tangibly reach out and touch you and see that you're a real person, but they hear your heart. And, and I think that you know the value of that is is priceless. Right. Because because we we've known many guys, you know, that that openly profess their faith, like you mentioned, you know, George and Nikita and and different ones. And I remember and this was several years ago. I was doing doing an event, a ministry event with Tully Blanchard. Yeah. And and Tully Tully shared something during that that really spoke to me because he said, you know, that when he was first first coming into understanding and, and believing in Christ, he had a uh, a real struggle with anger for a while. Because he looked at some around him that did know, and his anger was, you knew the truth and you didn't tell me. Uh. You know, and, and he said, so it took him a while to, to even grasp, you know, the fact that the miracle that God had done in his life and saved him for all eternity and, and gave, him, gave him a new start, in which now he's, you know, done ministry for a long, long time. Yes, sir. Um, and, but, and, but I thought about that when he was sharing that. You know, the, again, the value of what we have, not only is it priceless, but it's worth sharing. Right. You know, and, and like yourself, whether you're doing it on a, on a poster board or whether we're doing a, a show like this or just making an appearance at a school or wherever, um, there, are, there are people out there that need to hear. Right. And, and, and I think the, the, the ability, and I taught a lesson uh, in, a, in, a recent, in a recent teaching of, of our ability plus our availability is what makes the difference. Yeah. We have the tools, but do we use them? Right, and and so when we when we when we look at at the value of of who we are, we look at the value of of uh, you know, reaching into people. Not only do I think that we have to find that value within ourselves, but we like you know as as things were shared with you and as things were shared with our fellow guys that we know and and, and in our own on our own lives, we have to see through the eyes of Christ that there's a value in the soul of those around us. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that that's the value of, of what we are trying to offer here is we're, we're trying to, to let people know you matter. Because, right. because, you know, like you said, when someone takes that time to, to share something with you um, that's of great value, there should be a pause to say, wow, you care enough about me to tell me the truth. Yep. And, and that's what changes lives, right? Absolutely. And, and it's one of those things you've, you've heard this analogy before but it would be like a for us to not share the gospel would be like a doctor having a cure for cancer and not sharing that we're talking about someone's eternity whether they're going to spend it in heaven or they're going to spend it in hell yeah it, it's not a matter of you know where are you going to live next week or where are you going to live next year or, or what color sweater are you going to wear tomorrow <laughs> we're talking about someone's eternal soul yeah that we can save if we share that gospel That's with it. them and I think another thing that's important for Christian men to not only be bold with their faith and, as you said, be genuine with it, you know, there, there's an old quote that says, you know, share the gospel, use words if you must. That's right. Because the other thing is, if, if you have someone who doubts your words or is a bit skeptical, they may hear what you say, but they're going to pay a whole lot of attention to what you do. Oh, 100%. And then if your actions and your life's not backing that up, that's real easy for them to pick apart. So I, I think it's important for us to not only share the gospel, but we have to live it out ourselves. Absolutely, you know, and I and I think that there's there's there's, there's something important about that that people need to understand, regardless of our position in life, whether we're a public figure, a known notable person, whether it's celebrity athlete, or, or we're just a guy that's the cashier at Walmart. You know, when people see us. Uh, there's there's something about that, and and the and and if we are professing a faith, uh, those two have to match up. Yes, sir. It can't be you know <laughs> like for me you know I'm Pastor Randy on Sunday, but I still got to be him on Tuesday too. Absolutely. Or, or people are going to say, well, then that's not real. Yeah. You know, it's it's like you know again we use wrestling analogies. It's like playing the bad guy, mm-hmm. but you not really being a, a bad, bad guy. guy. <laughs> you know, people people okay they can understand a a role or a character. But that cannot be what our faith is. Right. That that is not a role. 
That, that is not, not made it's up. It's got to be our identity and it's, who it's, we are. It's got it's to be real. It's got to be real. Well, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll be right back with Coffee with the Pastor. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Coffee with the Pastor. This is Pastor Andy McDaniel, and we are excited to have you back with us today. We are with Lodi, a good friend of mine from back in the days of World Championship Wrestling. Lodi's been sharing with us this morning of the value of our testimony, the, the the value of our witness, the value of being real, uh, not playing a character, not not being you know to- toying around with things that are are, are questionable. You know, there's one things in life that we can we can look at and write off, but there's some things that can't be. You know, and so oftentimes um, we hear the word miracle. You know, and we kind of throw that around, and, and, and it's oftentimes associated with all kinds of different stuff. But but the word itself means an unexpected moment. It's something that oftentimes deals with the supernatural. As believers, obviously we know that God is in the miracle business. Yes, sir. God is not retired. God has not <laughs> gone on vacation. And nor has he decided he's done enough. They, okay, well, we've done enough miracles. We've met the quota. Everybody's on their own. <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I want to I share, um, for those that maybe don't know, uh, if you follow on social media, you probably have seen a story here about about uh, about loading, something that happened uh, not all that long ago. Uh, but uh, God worked a incredible miracle in your life my friend yes, and sir. i'd like for you to just share with the audience uh kind of how that came about and just 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 share your heart with them man yes sir um it's funny to hear it called a miracle uh and we'll get to it my surgeon used those exact words as well i had started to have some rapid heartbeats and kind of like an afib situation going on a couple of weeks out from a show and was a little nervous about it. I I knew something wasn't perfectly normal, uh, but didn't think it was anything major. And so um, like every other man I know, was a little stubborn about going to the doctor and getting it checked out or whatever. And it was June 17th. So three months ago, I had a show in Mooresville, North Carolina, which is about 52, 53 minutes from home where I am in Charlotte. So easy drive up anytime, you know, a lot of nights these days, I wrestle shows, you know, all over the place. And sometimes I can have a five, six, seven hour drive home. And if I've got an hour drive home, that's like a home game. You know, it's nice to be home early. And was wrestling one of my good friends, a young kid named Lucky Ali, who's fantastic in the ring. I just think the world of him. And probably five, six minutes into the match, I started feeling a little uncomfortable. Um, started having some chest pain and some severe jaw pain and a headache. And I could feel my heart racing. And I'm thinking to myself, I need to get through this match just so I can get to the back. And I've had injuries in the ring before and finished the match. I broke my ankle in 98 on a live nitro Mm -hmm. and finished the match. Um, That's just always been the way I was trained, and and that's kind of what we do. Somehow, some way, we get to the end, and I finished the match and struggled a little bit to get up and get to the back. And one of my young kids from my wrestling school was backstage, and I I didn't talk to anybody. I just wanted to get out of there because I did not feel good, and I was feeling progressively worse. And obviously, uh, uh, that was noticeable on my face because Chris was asking one of my kids, he's like, you know, do you want to pull your car around? Do you need some help? And I'm trying to blow him off. I just don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to get home. And finally got my stuff together and just getting out of my wrestling gear was a chore. It, it took me probably an hour to get undressed to get my oh, stuff wow. together, which is, un, you know, usually it's a little quicker than that. Yeah. But I was just moving slow and felt terrible. And got into my car and was leaving Mooresville and probably got on 77 South, maybe eight minutes down the road. And I started having just some really massive, severe chest pain. And the jaw pain and the headache was through the roof. And I I say I was scared, scared in the fact that I knew something was really wrong. Right. And I knew I needed to get to a hospital. And... Uptown Charlotte, is, I, though I live in Charlotte, it's not my, my backyard, and I don't know my way around that well. So my girlfriend was out west, and I called her, and I, and, you know, she says hello, and she was, and 
Idaho. And I said, what's the fastest hospital I can get into on a Saturday night at 9 o'clock uptown in Charlotte? And her reaction is like, if you're going to the doctor, something's bad. I'm like, what hospital? <laughs> and she says Presbyterian. And I hung up the phone because yeah. I had to put in my, my maps and get there and figure out how to get there. But I'm driving down 77, and I'm thinking – by the time I pull over and call an ambulance, I could probably drive myself there. But again, had that fear of, I don't want to hurt someone else. Sure. And I'm driving down 77 and through uptown Charlotte, doubled over at the waist, barely looking over, you know, my dashboard just to see where I was driving. And I saw the signs, made it to the hospital. I pulled in and Brock Anderson, who's also one of my wrestling kids, Arn Anderson's son, we, he and I had a talk the next week. We laughed about it, but I parked the car and stumbled into the emergency room and i got halfway in the door and there's a, a male and female behind the counter and the guy said sir are you okay i'm like i don't feel good he said you don't look good sit down right there where you are and so i sat down and they came out and got a wheelchair and did an ekg right there and said you know blood pressure the whole nine yards they're like yeah this isn't good we need to get you to the back and it turned out i was having a heart attack during the match wow and um and that was not part of the show. That was not part of the show. <laughs> that wasn't a planned injury. That wasn't something that was that we had just added. That was totally not something planned. Yeah. And they started running tests that Saturday night. It was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And they did a CT scan. They did the EKGs. They did the chest x-ray. Sunday morning they did ultrasound, all these different things. And it took them um, – since I went to rehab, I don't do pain pills of any kind anymore. I had my third discectomy and my neck surgery in 2017. Right. And once I was released that morning from the hospital, I refused to take any pain meds. And I just don't do that. And, and I was in so much pain. The lady's like, we're going to give you like four milligrams of morphine and we'll give you this, this, and this. And she said, you'll feel, you'll feel much better in 10 minutes. And 10 minutes later, she said, how do you feel? I'm like, I'm worse. And they hit me with three different doses of morphine. Wow. And my pain was still just off the charts. Wow. And I don't claim to be a tough guy, but I've got a pretty good pain threshold just from getting beat up my whole life and through wrestling. I don't think things hurt me normally or like a normal person does. But so once they got the pain under control by 3 or 4 o'clock Sunday morning, I didn't feel terrible, but all these tests kept coming back like, well, we don't think there's a block. We don't think there's an issue. But Monday afternoon, they said, we're going to send you back for a heart catheter. And what they do is they put the dye into your heart right. and find out if there's any blockages. And they said, hey, if we get in there and there's a small blockage, we can go ahead and put a stent or two in and you'll be out of here tomorrow. And so I went back in and they, when you do the heart cath, they put you under with a little bit of Ativan and fentanyl. And they, the anesthetist explained to me, she's like, you might fall asleep. You may not, but you won't feel anything. And I woke up. I actually, I fell asleep. I woke up, and the, the anesthesiologist was standing there, and it's like nobody else was in the room. And I looked up at her. I'm like, "Hey, how how did everything go?" And she's just like deaf hearing me, like she's not hearing me, and she's looking off in the distance. And I'm like, Psst, "I know you're not the doctor." <laughs> I said, "But can you kind of give me an idea of what went on?" And she looks around and she looked down at me. And she made eye contact and she goes, "It's not good." Wow. And that's not what you want to hear. No, <laughs> definitely not. But they take me out and they take me back to my room and a team of doctors come in and they put up a diagram on the wall on a, a dry erase board. And you have three arteries that supply your heart with blood. And two of the three were blocked at 100%. And the third one was blocked at 90. My goodness. So basically your heart's job is to pump blood and my heart was not getting any blood. <laughs> Uh, the surgeon met with me, said, you know, we could put stents in, but I don't think it's going to be. It's going to be like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. You're right. going to be back here in a couple of months having yeah. open-heart surgery. This gentleman, as he spoke to me, his demeanor was just so even keel. And the words he used, I don't know for sure. I can't explain it any better than that. Just when he started talking, I'm like, Whatever this guy's selling, I'm buying. This is my guy right here. Gotcha. And my dad was in the room, and my stepmom, and my girlfriend, and he said, you know, the other doctor's going to come in and talk to you about doing the stents and, and giving you some medication to break up those blockages. He said, but I don't think you have much of a choice. I think the open heart surgery is the way you need to go. Whenever you can figure out what you're doing, let me know. And the quicker you let me know, the quicker we can get you into surgery. So they left and looked over at my dad, who 
not a man of many words, but he's always pretty profound when he speaks. And I said, Dad, I, I had made up my mind what I want to do. Like we talked earlier, I'm 53 years old. I'm a grown man. I can make my own decision. But Dad's there. I wanted his opinion. I said, Dad, what do you think? He said, that man that just walked out of the room needs to do your surgery. And I said, that's what I think too. So um, the next morning they came, this ultrasound on my neck because they have to run uh, blood to your brain while you're right. um, working on your heart there, obviously. and want to make sure no blockage is there. So the, all day long, this Tuesday, had teams for the cardiac team guys coming in and explain to me what was going to happen. And so by 6.30 or 7 that night, I was in my room uh, by myself, and the surgeon walked in. He said, did you get to talk to the team today? Do you feel good about what we're doing? I said, I did. And before we go any further, I just wanted to let you know, when you came in yesterday, I really just liked the way you spoke to me and the way you carry yourself, the way you explain things. And I just I hope you don't think that's weird. I just wanted to say I, I wanted you to know that you're my guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he said, well, thank you. He said, you can obviously say no to this, but one thing I'd like to do with all my uh, patients the night before surgery, do you mind if I sit on your bed and pray with you? Wow. And he sat there and held my hand, and I cried for about 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, because here's my surgeon who, you know, is going to operate on me tomorrow, and he wants to pray for me. Wow. And so the surgery went obviously well. Um, I went in for a triple bypass. The bad news is they got in and found two more blockages, so I ended up having a quintuple bypass. Wow. So there wasn't three blockages. There were five. My goodness. And I was in ICU for a day and a half, and I mentioned earlier one of the things they want you to do is to get up and move. Right. And I I was in ICU with 11 other people. I could see them, and some of these people were much older and not in the shape I was in. And they had, you know, two or three physical therapists trying to help them up. And some of these people couldn't take but a couple steps and sat back down. And in my mind, I'd, I'd do everything kind of 110 miles an hour or faster, you know. <laughs> and um, my guy got me up. They, you know, they said, they, I made a lap around. And I said, hey, can I go for another one? They're like, sure. And I made two laps. And I said, can I go for I made three laps. I said, don't ask for a fourth. We've never had anybody do more than two, and you wow. just did three the morning out of surgery. So let's get you back in bed. Um, but I got out of the hospital a couple of days later. But when I saw my surgeon for the follow-up in August, he walked in and told me, because my surgery was actually three months ago today. Mm-hmm. Today's wow. September 21st, and then yeah. we had this, the surgery was June 21st. And he walked in in August when I saw him again. He goes, I couldn't tell you this in the hospital so you would understand it. He said, and I didn't want to scare you, but to use your word from early, he said, you're a walking miracle. Absolutely. He said, there is no reason for you to still be alive. Mm. He said, with those three blockages, you should have been dead. But wow. when we found the other two, he said, your heart was getting no blood. My goodness. And so I said, well, what do you think now? He said, I think you're great. And um, he said, I'm turning you loose to your to a cardiologist and your general practitioner. But the cool thing was, and I, he said, before you leave, can we all pray together? Wow. He had his nurse there. And so when I say... You know, he called it a walking miracle, and he called me a miracle, and I think obviously that was God's hand. But I was surrounded by so many praying people. Yes. People in the hospital, from my surgeon praying for me, to my friends who stopped by and prayed for me, to my pastor friends who stopped by and prayed for me. My pastor at Forest Hill Church called me the night before surgery and prayed with me on the phone for about 20 minutes. Mm. And what I didn't know until I went back to church a couple of weeks later— I was telling, um, I said, I need to go by and tell Jonathan, thank you for calling me, because that was really special for him to call and pray with me. found out he was on vacation Mm. and took time off to call and pray with me. So you talk about making sacrifices and loving others like Jesus. I just, I was surrounded by so many loving, praying, godly people that the whole thing was just covered up with God, and it was just fantastic. And I think that is... You know, um, I've got a lot of people to thank. You know, Arne Brock came by and sat, sat with me. And for me, you know, as a kid growing up watching Arne Anderson oh, as a wrestler, my goodness, yeah. to working with him at WCW to train his kids. But then when I have heart surgery, he comes and brings me food. You know, it's just so when I say I've lived a blessed and charmed life and I've got a lot of people who care about me, I think that was one of the things that floored me the most were just 
I am loved and cared about by way more people than I deserve. And it was so humbling to get all of that. It was almost too much, that's, to be honest with you. But it's it, incredible. Yeah. You know, when, again, we, we use that word miracle. You know, I think the, the miracle in and of itself is, is, is not simply simply the, the fact that you're still alive, obviously. I mean, God's providential hand was in that, that he got yes, you home. Sir. He got you through the match. He got you home. Yeah. He got you to the appropriate people like that. But But I think... Even what we were talking about earlier, the value in being real, God God showed you he's extremely <laughs> real. Uh, uh, because, again, by medical nature and every other reason, again, you know, obviously not many people could have survived that. Right. And, and I think that, you know, being able to share that, uh, there's someone out there today, that, you know, that is, that is struggling with their faith, maybe don't have any at all. And, and, and they're hearing this and they're saying, wait a minute, maybe there's something else I need to reassign, re- recheck, whatever in my life. Because again, uh, we had talked about this earlier off the air, but being, being a physical specimen, working out, eating good and stuff like that, uh, one would just assume, and we know what assuming does, uh, you know, that, okay, well, you, 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 you couldn't have any problems. You should be, you should be fine. Right. But we're all just one breath away. And regardless of our you know, stature, whether we're, you know, six foot eight and 300 pounds or, we're, right. you know, whatever. It's got nothing to do with that. It is the preparedness of our heart, not the medical condition of it. Yes, it is the preparedness. And so so the, the beauty of God's presence, oftentimes it gets it gets lost in the noise of today. And I, I want to just thank you uh, personally, you know, for sharing that openly, because people people need to hear that. Not not just because of, oh, and Lodi had a heart attack and he made it. No, the, the, no, he didn't make it. You know, God God, <laughs> God God had His hand on this man, and, oh, and 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 God has His hand on you out there that are, are listening today. You know, we we've talked about uh, in 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 this time together the the value of our testimony and our witness, and, and we've we we hear about this incredible miracle of God uh, that He's that He's done in your life. Um, when we when we come back in our in our closing segment, I want to talk about. I want to talk about a sensitive subject for just a moment as we as we prepare to close and and meet our audience uh, today. As we're coming out of this this miracle, um, there are many who aren't prepared to receive that miracle. Right. There are many who are not prepared that if they were driving home, they probably wouldn't have had a wrestling match, most likely. <laughs> but but uh, but yeah. we're all in a fight with the devil, amen. We're all and, in a fight, <laughs> yes, sir. And so so every day they, they may not be they may not be coming from that, but they may be coming from multiple different things. Uh, you know, may, maybe it's in, in an abusive situation, maybe it's depression, maybe it's a medical issue, maybe it's whatever addiction. It could be all kinds of things. We're all in a fight, and there's only one tag team partner that we really need for that yes, one. Sir. You know, and it, it's one, you know, I, I, I tagged a couple of times with the Barbarian many years <laughs> ago, and I always thought I was really safe if Barbie was in my right, corner. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but, but nothing beats Jesus, nothing amen? Nothing beats so Jesus. So we're, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Thank you for joining us here at Coffee with the Pastor. Welcome back, everybody, to Coffee with the Pastor. We have been having an incredible time together today, and I hope that everything that we have said today um, resonates, that, that you have heard our heart. Uh, I've been talking with uh, professional wrestler Lodi from the World Championship Wrestling Days. Uh, what, a, what a magical time that was. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, and and uh, I've, been, I've been around wrestling this year 50 years. I started going to matches when I was four years old. Wow. You know, I, I'll never forget the very, very, very first time. Uh, you know, my first night was Wahoo McDaniel and yeah. Johnny Valentine. So we're going, we're going, we're going back to the archives, yes. right? Yes. And uh, and a young a young uh, braggart named um, uh, Rick Flair was what happened to be around that time as well. But not not to drop names, but but the 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 point of that uh, statement is it's been a staple part of my life forever. Um, I had the the absolute privilege and honor to have a minor, I mean, blip on the radar moment of being a, being a kid 
living out a dream and i got to do a few matches you in did my life. yeah you know, I, I got to do that and and, and uh was never anybody but you know it's, it's kind of one of those things you look back on you say i got to do it you did you know but the cool thing about that for me and this is what i want to touch on is getting to know so many people over the years that like, like you mentioned with arn that we grew up with you know, when, when when I would get phone calls and as I got to be friends with the Tully Blanchards and the Wahoos and the Boogie Woogie Man and all yes. that, you know, when they yeah, would me. call me at home, I'm a fan all over again. I'm like yeah. looking on my phone saying, that's a boogie man. You know, <laughs> but 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 uh, but Lodi, you know, in all seriousness, the, the, uh, I want to touch on this sensitive matter for just a moment. Um, over the last many years, uh, we've we've lost a lot of our fellow brothers and, and friends in the in the wrestling business. Um, that's reality. That's life. As you mentioned earlier, it it may have been an addiction problem. It may have been suicide. Or like like uh, you know like uh, last week, uh, Abe Jacobs passed away. He was ninety five. Right. A- Abe had a long long a long life. life. You know? But regardless uh, of the reason why, and the regardless of the reality of life and death. Here's what here's what concerns my heart, and and you know this, and I know you shared this with me. Um, many of them were not ready, right? Many of them were not ready, and, and I don't say that to be critical or judgmental or anything else. We know many people in our lives, friends, family, loved ones, you know, acquaintances, whatever, that are not ready. So as as we as we are working on our closing segment here, Lodi, I, I want you to take just a moment and I want you to share, if you will, uh, with our listeners today, how vital that decision is before we leave this earth. You just talked about an incredible miracle, a miracle that took place that but but the hands of God were on you. And we don't say that to 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 elevate you personally or to say, well, I'm better than you because I know Jesus. But 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 he's, he's what got you through. How, yeah. how, do, how do we articulate that with our listening audience today? You and I had a conversation a little earlier about a friend of mine who runs the Christian Wrestling Federation. And a little over two years ago, he had a heart attack. <clears throat> and he and I both have spoken together about how before that time when we would speak we'd always you know we, we've used the line i think every pastor or speaker at some point has you don't know if you'll make it home tonight right. you don't know if you'll make it through tomorrow we don't know when that time comes or it's going to come only god knows that <clears throat> but if you're not ready and you're, you're not right with god when that time comes your eternity's decided yes and so i feel like not trying to scare people into making a decision for Christ, but to definitely ask themselves, you know, are you where you need to be in your walk with Jesus and your belief? And are you a follower of Jesus that if you did have a heart attack tonight or you did not make it through the night, whatever the case may be, where are you going to spend your eternity? Yes. And are you ready for that with the choices you've made? Because, you know, he says all we have to do is come to him that's it and ask for forgiveness that's it He's made it so <laughs> it's simple, a free man. gift he really has I'm telling you. the greatest gift in the world the world will ever know is totally free to us we just have to accept that and i feel like if you're listening to this today you, you touched on a myriad of problems whether it be relationship problems or work problems or financial problems or with your family or medical illness i mean there's a there's a gazillion different things that your listeners are probably going through, mm-hmm. but all of them can be made better with Jesus in your life. Amen. Amen, no doubt. I mean, Scripture is clear, you know, and again, regardless of where you are, a lot of people, uh, and as I, I've been doing this now for a long, long time, uh, as far as ministry is concerned, and a lot of people get caught up in the idea, well, i, I got to get some things straight. <laughs> Let him get it straight. Yes, go to him all, now. All he says is, come to me. Right. Come to me. If you're heavy laden, if you're tired, I'll give you rest. I will show you the right thing to do. So many people, again, they struggle with that of, well, I, I got to do this. I got to do that. But the thing is, it's, it's like straightening up our house. It never really gets done. You know, right. we put stuff away and then the dog drink breaks it back out. Or yeah. if you got kids, they find, you know. They're going to find it. it, it yeah. There's always something. So life, again, life can be a mess. 
and, and, and it will continue to have times of being a mess, even after you know Jesus. But Absolutely. Just, just like whether, again, whether we have a medical emergency or a, a family emergency or some type of drama or stress in our life, we've got one we can turn back to. We've got a, a source Always. of strength that nothing can take away. You know, even 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 in a in a deflated state of uh, being tired, or, or or like in your case after a surgery or whatever case, you may not be as strong today as you were six months ago, but you've got a a a a, a spiritual strength that can never be right. can never be lowered at, and, at all, and, and may be stronger now than it was exactly <laughs> after exactly. what I went through yeah, and absolutely. knowing absolutely, and that's the that thing. He, so I want to I want people to understand that today is is and I love what you said. This is not about scaring you to death. This is not about uh, you know trying to, to to sell anything or nothing. This is about reality because the one thing, regardless of our differentials in life, whether it's belief systems or or lifestyles or anything else, there is one reality that binds us all. Death is real. Yes. And what you do after that, that's that you have to conclude that before you leave here. Right. You know, I mean, that 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 finished is already booked. I mean, it, Absolutely. It, it's it's there. One in and, one die. Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, Tony, Tony Evans said years ago, the number one cause for death is birth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact. I mean, Absolutely. That's an absolute fact. And so we want people today to understand. We, we, we care. We, we're doing this. It's a great time of conversation and, and laughs and sincerity and everything else. But if you're listening today and you've never made that decision, you, you've never maybe considered, you know, if you're driving in a car or if you're listening on your couch, either of those places could be it. And again, that's not to be fearful. Right. But but either you, you I mean you can have the heart attack on the couch as well as you can in the car yes, or, or or a wrestling ring or wherever it may be. And, and so I, I want people to really consider that today and say, you know what, um, what I'm listening to these guys say is giving me a moment for pause. I need to examine this. And, and again, Ro- Romans Romans chapter ten is the most beautiful thing in the world. It says, if you will confess with your mouth. If you will call upon the name of Jesus and believe that God rose him on the third day, that he died on the cross for your sins. Scripture is so beautiful because it's so simple. It says, you shall be saved. Correct. How simple is that? I mean, that is the one, two, three. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's it. That, that is it. That is the finish. That is it. And if you will do that today, friends, it'll change your life forever. I'm not going to sit and tell you that all your problems are going to go away and you'll never have another issue because that wouldn't be honest. But I believe it'll change your life forever because I know it changed mine. Yes, sir. I know it changed my friend Lodi's. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank our special guest, Lodi, for giving us uh, his time today, sharing some time here at Coffee with the Pastor. Awesome conversation, my friend. Uh, I want to thank our listeners, as always, to share a portion of your day with us, as you always do. You're so gracious. And to all of our fellow pastors out there, we always want to talk to you. Remember what Jesus asked Peter. He said, do you love me? And if you do... Feed my sheep. And I want to encourage all of you today. The struggles are out there, society, culture, all the different stuff is changing around us. But Jesus is a constant. God says in the book of Malachi, I am God and I never change. You can hold on to him through thick and thin and through it all. I want to thank you again for joining us. This is Coffee with the Pastor. I am your host, Pastor Andy McDaniel. And Lord willing, we'll be back here next week with another great conversation around the table. Until then, God bless you. And never forget, as we always close, Jesus is good all the way to the last drop. You've been listening to Coffee with the Pastor with your host, Andy McDaniel. Connect and learn more when you visit the podcast page at Christian1057.com and join us each week for Coffee with the Pastor on Christian 105.7.